Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing and give praise to God's name. Tell the good news of salvation from day to day. Welcome to worship with Christ Presbyterian Church on Sunday, February 28th. Let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. Again, good morning and welcome to worship with Christ Presbyterian Church. A few announcements to share with you. Again, we want to extend our gratitude to Carlton Hoke, who is our artist creating our banner for Lent. You'll notice that it's going to change a little bit each week. Thank you for Carlton for sharing your gifts with us in that way. We will gather at 1130 in the sanctuary for midday prayer again this morning. Please sign up using the link in the comments. Lent kits are still available to be picked up and files can be found. Digital files of the Lent kits can be found online on the website. We need your help. We need volunteers to help with our new streaming equipment for worship. So if you are interested in doing that, or even finding out more about how to do that, please contact Susie Weisinger or send an email and we will put you in touch with Susie. There are other volunteer opportunities that you will see in your email, which again, we encourage you to sign up for the weekly email so that you can be in the loop on all that is going on with CPC. Some of those volunteer opportunities can even be done from home, so please check those out. The link for signing up for emails can be found in the comments as well, in addition to links to the bulletin, the sermon text, and online giving. We ask that you return your pledge cards as soon as you can, and if you are in need of offering envelopes, those are ready to be picked up. If you need someone to pick those up for you, please contact the office and we will make sure that yours get delivered to you. 
If you are interested in learning more about life with Christ Presbyterian Church, please send us a message through Facebook or Instagram or email us and we will be in touch. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. Holy One, we gather this day and come as we are with our repenting hearts and our persistent dreaming. Accept all we bring before you today. Accept our worship, we pray. We come before God not as despised sinners, but as beloved children. With the confidence of children of God, let us humbly confess our sin before God and one another. Gracious God, you are so patient with us. Day in and day out, week in and week out, you call us to wake up to our opportunity to bear fruit, and yet, Lord, you know our strengths and our shortcomings better than we do ourselves. Ever patient and merciful, forgive us our wrongdoings. Plant seeds of changes in our hearts. As we worship you this day, may your word nourish us and strengthen us as we seek to be better followers of you. May we be buds of goodness and kindness, of light and of love. Patient God, hear us as we pray. Amen. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins on, in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good 
I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. Testify to us, O God, by the voice of your Spirit. Put your law in our hearts. Write your word in our minds. And show your will in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Last week, Jesus left us wondering what it means to be a neighbor alongside the legal expert, Martha, Mary, the Samaritan, and that one in the ditch. From there, Jesus goes on to teach the disciples how to pray and to warn them about hypocrisy. We're on our way to Jerusalem, of course, and the closer we get to Jerusalem, the more charged the rhetoric and the atmosphere grow. At the end of chapter 12 of Luke's gospel, Jesus speaks of what lies ahead for him and the division his kingdom brings. Even as he urges those listening to watch for signs of the changes on the horizon and to choose what is right, even in the face of persecution. Now I invite you to listen as I read from Luke chapter 13 from the Common English Bible. Together, let us listen for the word of God. Some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. Jesus replied, Do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were more sinful than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. What about those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty of wrongdoing than everyone else who lives in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. Jesus told this parable. A man owned a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He said to his gardener, look, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree for the past three years and I've never found any. Cut it down. Why should it continue depleting the soil's nutrients? The gardener responded, Lord, give it one more year and I will dig around it and give it fertilizer. Maybe it will produce fruit next year. If not, then you can cut it down. At that same time, some Pharisees approached Jesus and said, go, get away from here because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus said to them, go tell that fox, look. I'm throwing out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will complete my work. However, it is necessary for me to travel today, tomorrow, and the next day, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you, How often I have wanted to gather your people just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you didn't want that. Look, your house is abandoned. I tell you, you won't see me until the time comes when you say blessings on the one who comes in the Lord's name. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You're invited to pause and reflect for a moment on the text. Amen. So the people want to know what happened. They want to know why those worshipers died the way they did. What did they do, Jesus? Is there something they could have done to avoid their fate? It's a natural question, or at least a very human one. When something awful happens, we want an explanation. We crave a cause and effect. Or we think we do. We think if we know why it happened to them, we can keep it, whatever it is, from happening to us. And the more we spend our time and our energy asking, what about them? We can hold things at a safe distance. True to form, Jesus does not let the people hold the hard questions at a safe distance at least not for long, he takes the what about them question and quickly flips the script to what about you? As my colleague, Dr. Heather Shortledge writes, Jesus doesn't seem to be interested in floating down that river of comparisons with us. Jesus wants our story, warts and all, and only our story. Stop fretting, she says, over the pilgrims and Galileans and what they did to deserve such an ending. The end happens in every story. We don't know how many pages are left. Stick to reading your own story. God will take it from there. This flipped script is not a new thing for Jesus. Just last week, Martha huffed with exasperation at Jesus over what Mary was not doing. I imagine her finger pointing at her sister and Jesus insisting on gently and firmly turning that finger back to Martha. He does the same thing here. He takes the what about thems and turns them into what about yous over and over and over again, and he drills down on repentance, or as the common English Bible reads, changing hearts and lives. For Jesus, this repentance thing is not a once and done thing. The root of the word repent in Greek means turn, and here Jesus uses a verb tense that can literally be translated, repent and keep on repenting, turn and keep on turning. As Heather writes, the way of Jesus, the way to Jesus, is not a one-shot deal that saves us from falling. Rather, it's a lifestyle choice. I will keep on repenting today, tomorrow, and ever on into the future. In this life, the work of repentance never ends. Jesus makes sure the disciples hear this word a lot, she writes. Perhaps the more times it hits their ears the better the chance of it sinking in. Maybe that's why we have to hear that word so often, too. Repentance can be overwhelming, especially if I do the hard work of examining and sitting with all the ways I fall short, all the ways I participate in the world's falling short of what God dreams for the world, the new creation God longs for. It's easy to get bogged down and feel defeated. No wonder I move so quickly to the what about thems? But they are behaving badly, Jesus. They are so mean, but they are getting away with everything. It is so much easier to point to them than it is to face what I see when I ask, what about me? When was the last time you were encouraged to daydream? When was the last time you allowed yourself to daydream, to let your mind wander? 
For me, daydreaming brings to mind laughable images of Ralphie in a Christmas story when he imagines his teacher weeping with joy and giving him an A++++ for his essay arguing why he needs a Red Ryder BB gun for Christmas. Ralphie has a vivid imagination, and that imagination almost always gets him into trouble. His career as a daydream believer is held up as nostalgic childhood silliness. It is sweet enough, but not the stuff of serious life in the world. But Professor David Lowe suggests that we need to spend a bit of time daydreaming as part of our repentance work. Yes, daydreaming. Because God invites us to dream something beyond what we can presently see. Scripture is, of course, full of dreams, powerful dreams that paint a picture of what life could be if and when God has God's way. Jesus dabbles in a bit of daydreaming, too, imagining the kingdom of God with and for us out loud. He dreams of an enemy Samaritan stopping to help and save a stranger. He imagines a struggling fig tree and a protective mother hen. That fig tree is deemed a waste of space and resources by the vineyard owner. That is all the vineyard owner can see. A gardener steps in and invites the vineyard owner to see something that must be imagined, must be dreamed. The gardener pleads for a bit more time so that he can tend to the struggling tree, give it nourishment and TLC so that it can be what God has imagined, so that it has one more chance to thrive and bear fruit. And Jesus imagines himself as a mother hen desperate to gather the wandering and vulnerable chicks under her wing to keep them safe from all that would do them harm. His is a daydream of a different kind of kingdom with an entirely different kingdom agenda. In Jesus, God dreams big things for the people. He dreams of a people who turn from all that would harm them and lead them astray. He dreams of their turning back to him, the only one, the only one who can actually save them and give them, give us life that is genuinely abundant and free. Friends, what does God dream for you? What does God dream for the world through you? What might God want for or from you? Where might God want you to turn? Can you imagine? Can you think of one thing, one relationship, one habit, one grudge, just one thing that you could shift or change or let go of that might bring you closer to who God longs for you to be in and for the world. Is there some practice or habit you might take up that would produce more abundant life for you, for those around you? This odd and challenging year has left us worn down and worn out. We have found ourselves staring at the same screen and the same four walls many days and have divided from one another in ways we could not have imagined 12 months ago. There are many days when I, at least, feel a bit like the bedraggled fig tree that is not bearing the fruit I would like to. Other days, I feel like a frantic chick who does not know how to do much beyond scurry and fret. In my weariness and my scurrying, it helps me to pause, to pray, and to realize that God in Christ dreams far more for me than I have dared to imagine on my own. Far better than my preoccupation with pointing my finger at all that they are doing or not doing. Yes, Jesus condemns and confronts 
all that oppresses God's beloved children. And he expects, fully expects his church to do the same. But it's about getting our own house and our own hearts in order, perhaps, first. Because no good news, no gospel is found in the what about thems. The good news comes in hearing that there is still time for the failing fig tree. Still time for the frantic chick. Still time for me and for us if we can only find a way to turn and keep turning back to the one who wants to nurture us. The only one who can save us. So maybe it's time to daydream a bit, to let my mind wander away from the dead end, what about thems, to the holy and hope-filled, what could be with me's. Maybe it's time to daydream, to let my heart trust and believe all that God dreams for me and for us. If Jesus can be a daydream believer, maybe it would be a good thing for me to try. And if I allow myself to daydream, even just a bit, I might just begin to see a spot for me safe under his protective wings with yet another chance to be nourished and shaped into one who bears good and holy fruit for his sake and in his name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, friends, let us pray. Holy One who came as a child, we pray for your children everywhere. For those who are hungry, we pray for nourishment. For those who are fleeing, we pray for safety. For those who are ill, we pray for your healing. For those who are grieving, we pray for your peace. For those who are suffering, we pray for your presence. Holy Trinity, who patterns community, we pray for communities everywhere. For those who are divided, we pray for unity. For those who are isolated, we pray for connection. For those who are afraid, we pray for courage. For those who are frustrated, we pray for new hope. We pray for those known to us who suffer this day, including Stan and Jenny, Donna and Joe, Herb and Dottie, Bill and Sharon, Mike and Stan, Joanne, Bill's family and friends, Tom and Jack, Sue and Francis, the King family, George, Leanne, Loretta, Mary, Helen, Lorna, the Cochrans, Garrett and his family, Dottie, Matt and his family, Macklin and her family, and Abby. Here too our prayers for those whose pain we do not or cannot see, and for those we name before you now, in silence or aloud. Holy three in one and one in three, bless us in the work of faith that we might be truly faithful. Nourish us in the labor of love that we might show your love. Keep our hope steadfast that we might know your grace and your peace as we wait for your coming reign of justice and overwhelming love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who teaches us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to go forth into God's good world in peace and joy, to daydream just a little bit, to imagine what God has in store for us and for all. May we continue to turn back to him for life and love and salvation. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and stay with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.